This is your host Joy Cruel. You are listening to Relentless Flashbacking. In every episode, I will time travel to explore a year, and I'll talk about its historical events, stuff, toys, cars, TV, movies, and music. You'll find Relentless Flashbacking on Mixcloud, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. With this episode, I'll talk about 1969, a troubled year that will leave its positive and negative marks in the following years. A year that is already gazing towards towards the new era they will start in the 70s In 1969, the first Long John Silver's opens in Kentucky. This quick restaurant is specialized in seafood and it got a pirate team. Starting from the name, it clearly comes from one of the main characters of the one of the greatest novel ever, Treasure Island. Then there is the first Wendy's that opens in Ohio. In 2018 it will become the world's third largest hamburger fast food chain, following the giants McDonald's and Burger King. Then Pepsi introduces Schwipschwop in Germany, its own version of Spezzi, a mixture of cola and orange soda. In 1969 Germany, tomorrow the world. Not Spezzi and similar products will have success only in German-speaking countries. In this year, the first ATM is installed in New York, and a Boeing 747 lands in New York, and this is the first flight for this airplane. The ancestor of internet, ARPANET, is operative for the first time, connecting two colleges and sending the first electronic message ever. Now it's time to talk about the great albums of 1969. First, let me explain why this year is a turning point for music. What I will expose aren't rules or something that's an absolute truth. It's just something to give you a glimpse over an intricate panorama. What I will expose isn't a scientific or detailed explanation. It's only an overview to let you understand in a nutshell all the changes but without 1000 shades. In the 50s, the rock and roll introduced the idea of music made by and for young people, so there was music for the young and music for the grown-ups. Then in the 60s, this kind of music was further divided. When Rolling Stones preferred to follow their influences instead of following what Beatles were doing, the press started to describe them as enemies. This difference was exaggerated, but it's true that their sound is in some way antithetical. The Beatles are the gentle, elegant, calm and peaceful side of music. All peace and love, with very few peaks of aggression, such as Elter Skelter, but then if you think that it was rearranged only as a response to The Who and that the original version was perfect to fell asleep at the wheel, you can understand the Beatles' attitude in music. On the other side, the Rolling Stones, after a couple of albums, revealed all their roots that they are plunged into the muddy banks of the Mississippi. The band is soaked with American blues. It's aggressive and arrogant. So it's easy to see the Beatles as the good guys on one side and then on the other side you can see the Rolling Stones as the bad guys. In 1969, with the tragic death of the Rolling Stone guitarist Brian Jones and the awful events of the Altamont concert, this dualism is further amplified. In fact, this 1969 will be the year of the exasperation of this musical difference that will become more and more clear over the years. On one hand, there will be hard rock, heavy metal and punk, and on the other side there will be soft music and the disposable and pre-cooked products with the easy listening and the disco music. Usually, when we talk about hard rock, heavy metal and punk, profit is a side effect and not the main objective. The main objective is to be able to write great music and to share it with those who can understand it. Of course there will be exceptions, but this gap that starts as soft against hard 
hard or if you want kindness against aggression through the 70s and the 80s will become more and more as a sweat blood and true against pre-cooked and fake then from the 90s and onwards this gap will become more blurred because many easy listening artists will disguise themselves as somebody from the other side of the fence with a pre-packaged rebellion but I will analyze this problem in the next episodes of course I talked only about hard rock heavy metal and punk because I was talking about music made by and for young people but if I have to expand the view on all the music it's implied that all the music that's not a product is on the side where hard rock heavy metal and punk stand for example blues or jazz and all the music that you can't listen in every shops of a mall I think that two quotes can let you understand this difference better than my poor words first a quote from the great composer Vangelis if for example the music drives the composer the result will be honest and healthy if the composer drives the music the result will be dishonest and record business and then a quote from the movie Wayne's World I mean Led Zeppelin didn't write tunes that everyone liked they left that to the Bee Gees so in this episode I should only talk about music from 69 but tonight we will listen to All Along the Watchtower played by Jimi Hendrix even if it's a song from 1968 the reason behind this odd choice is that this song well displayed the musical split that begins in 1969. On one side there is an artist with a capital A, Bob Dylan. I have the maximum respect for him. But he is a folk artist, calm, placid and perfect to fall asleep at the wheel. On the other side there is Jimi Hendrix who takes the phenomenal idea by Bob Dylan and then he transforms it in an aggressive, atmospheric, pointy and manly piece of art. Same song, different arrangement and here is the gap of which I spoke early. On one side you got a peaceful and lethargic effect and on the other side you got an energetic and overwhelming effect. Bob Dylan himself will prefer to play his song with the Jimi Hendrix arrangement since he is surprised by this new version. This song is from the last album by the Jimi Hendrix Experience, Electric Ladyland, and it's an incredible masterpiece. The oddity is that the cover should have been a photo of the band and some children near the Alice in Wonderland monument in Central Park in New York. Linda Eastman took the photo and she will marry Paul McCartney in this 1969. The American label totally ignored the Jimi request and releases the album with a blurred red and yellow photo of Jimi while the English label manages to do worse and publishes a cover with 19 naked women. Jimi disappointed will express disapproval for both covers. But now let's listen to the epic All Along the Watchtower. <laughs> In this section I'll talk about the toys of 1969. The usual and classic toys rule the market, along with the board games. Mattel is already a giant that dominates with Barbie and the little cars branded as Hot Wheels that were introduced in 1968 to compete with the British Matchbox, founded in 1953. Still talking about classic toys, here is the Big Wheel, the most famous famous low-riding tricycle, cheaper and safer than the classic tricycles and bicycles. During the 70s it will have a big success and in 1978 they will produce an old black edition that will be called Cobra, the most badass low-riding tricycle ever. The modern history of LEGO began in 1958 
and this 1969 Duplo product line make its debut and with a range of simpler blocks is designed for children under 5 years. In 1977 Lego will introduce the first Duplo figures, then in 1983 they will be redesigned and in 2020 this line will be still available. But for a revolution in the world of toys we will have to wait until 1977 with the advent of the Kenner Star Wars line. Ses premiers pas dans la vie, les jeux du plot lui donnent la main avec le roulibouli. Avec de grosses briques, des petits bonhommes et des animaux, Bébé fait dix choses de ses dix doigts. Bébé a grandi et mène sa vie. Les jeux du plot ont grandi et Bébé donne la main à sa petite sœur. Les jeux du plot marchent la main dans la main avec Bébé. On January 12, 1969, the first Led Zeppelin album arrives, and its importance is just priceless. It's legit to say that this is one of the first hard rock albums, and during these early years, it's uncommon that a debut album is already hard rock. Just think about other hard rock heroes, such as Deep Purple, that started with a psychedelic sound. The Led Zeppelin lineup has names that are branded with fire in their hard rock history. Robert Plant on vocals, Jimmy Page on guitar, John Paul Jones on bass and keyboards, and finally John Bonham on drums. It's a lethal combination. There is no element less important than the others. The Led Zeppelin albums are great also because of this. This band is practically pioneering in this year, when hard rock is still in a fetal state. And they release a mature, perfect, manly album. And think, again, that it's only their debut album. With a start like this, it's clear that more masterpieces and success will arrive. Success that, as I said before, wasn't artificially created by the music business, but it's obtained just playing with the heart and instilling their dominant souls into the record. The cover shows the LZ-129 airship Inderburg, a few seconds after catching fire. The German airship was built by Zeppelin in 1935 and is still the largest flying object ever built. Unfortunately, in 1937, while trying to dock, it caught fire, and in half a minute it was completely destroyed, with 35 victims. This was the end of the use of the airships for transportation. This picture is attached to the origin of the name of the band. Back in 1966, Jimmy Page, John Paul Jones and Jeff Beck tossed around the idea of forming a new band with Keith Moon and John and Twistle from The Who. Moon allegedly said the band would go over like a lead balloon. Adam Twistle allegedly added more like a lead zeppelin, referring to the terrible disaster of the Hindenburg. In 1968, Page named his new band Led Zeppelin, still remembering what they said to him. The album is based on blues, and most of the songs are mid-tempos that go beyond 5 minutes, but they aren't boring because they have a special atmosphere. But when they put the pedal to the metal, it's a real shock. We are in 1969 and Led Zeppelin aren't in the same league of peaceful and sleepy hippies. Piece. This band used their instruments as attack weapons. Just listen to Communication Breakdown to understand that a new era is just arrived. <laughs> In 
this section I'll talk about the automotive world. This year is at the 69th place for the crude oil price ranking over 74 years, a ranking from the most expensive to the cheapest year. In fact, the price in 1969 is just $3. There are $22 in 2018 money. To let you understand how cheap is the crude oil in this year, just think that in 2018 the price will be $58. This 1969 is a golden year for cars. It's so rich that even two concept cars will make history. In Italy, Alfa Romeo at the Turin Auto Show introduces the devastating Iguana, a car that slashes your throat at the first sight. Behind its wedge design there is Giorgetto Giugiaro, the mind that created some of the best cars of the past and that will be dominating also in the future. In Australia, Holden presents its first concept car, the futuristic and advanced Hurricane. Think that in 69 this car already has automatic air conditioning, a navigator and a rear view camera. And then a look at its hydraulic canopy and the hidden headlamps is enough to reach a sensory overdrive. This extreme design is also the characteristic of another car, the Probe 16. It's designed and manufactured by the Adams Brothers that will produce only three cars. Only two Probe 16 will survive. The first one will go down in flame. In 1971, the car will appear in the shocking movie A Clockwork Orange with the name Durango 95. Now, let's go back in Italy. Between 1967 and 1969, only 152 Ferrari Dino 206 GT were produced. And now, Ferrari is ready with the second generation, the 246 GT. This car has almost the same look of the first generation, but inside is far more advanced and it's the best generation for the Ferrari Dino. With 146 miles per hour of pure pleasure, this car is just legendary and is covered by a thick and timeless charm. It will be produced until 1974. The Ferrari Dino 246 GT isn't the only second generation of this year. Jaguar introduces the second generation of another automotive masterpiece, the E-Type. As far as I'm concerned, this is the best generation of the E-Type, since it improves, but it doesn't forget the first generation. It's pure elegance on wheels, and it's another car that's unforgettable. It will be produced until 1971. In USA, two cars are introduced to the public. One is famous for its luxury, and the other one for its sportiness. The Imperial is the luxury division of Chrysler, and since 1955 is a separate make and it will remain as such until 1970. It's the 12th generation if you count also the Chrysler years or it's the 6th generation if you are an imperial fanatic. This land yacht with a remarkable and outstanding handling doesn't fear the competition with Cadillac and Lincoln and, without any doubt, is one of the best cars of 1969. Mercury introduced the Cyclone back in 1964 and, in 1968, presented the third generation. With aggressive restyling, the Cyclone became something more attractive. But it's in this 69 that arrives the definitive Mercury Cyclone, the CJ Fastback Coupe, where the CJ stands for Cobra Jet, an engine with 335 horsepower and a top speed of 122 miles per hour. This version is produced only for 69. He got a striped hood and a competition handling package, and it's one of the best muscle car ever. Kick Out the Gems by MC5 arrives in February of 1969 and it's another shock to the music of these years. MC5 released a live recording as a debut album, perhaps to refuse any kind of artifice and to underline their total sincerity. This album will not be important only for hard rock, but also for punk, that we love so much to this seminal record that MC5 will be often described as proto-punk. This record also shows another thing, the American hard rock 
rock is different from the British one. The British hard rock is refined, technical, and although is aggressive, it always has a savoir faire. Instead, the American hard rock is brutal, urgent, and doesn't say sorry. In fact, the album already begins with a provocative speech that incites to rebel and to be part of the solution. Then, after the first track, the cover of Rambling Rose, there is the song Kick Out the Gems that starts with a threatening Kick out the gems, adding more fuel to the fire using one of the most taboo words in the English language. In fact, Elektra Records is so shocked that it will publish a censored version. The album, in addition to the Rambling Rose cover by Ted Taylor, contains more covers, I Want You Right Now by The Trucks and The Motor City Is Burning by John Lee Hooker. This song is about the Detroit riots of 1967. In July of 1967, there was one of the worst violent and destructive riots in the United States, with 43 dead and 7,200 arrests. Behind this riots there were the usual and institutionalized racism and the usual episodes of brutality by the police. But all this talk of rebellions and riots wasn't a pose for the five angry boys from the Motor City. MC5 participate in protests against the Vietnam War and they collaborate with the White Panther Party, an anti-racist political collective founded in 1968 to support the Black Panther Party that are fighting for African-American rights. Kick Out the Gems is completed with five original songs, all marked by the explosive and desecrating force of MC5 that makes this album a masterpiece. With this album the episode ends. There are more topics from 1969 that I have to explore, but in the next episode I'll travel to 1996. Please subscribe to the channel and follow the show on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. If you want to give your support, please visit Patreon. And remember that you can find a t-shirt for every year on Teespring. Relentless flashbacking is easy to find because the name is unique all over the web. And now here is MC5, we kick out the gems. Stay outrageous, stay larger than life, Romeo, Foxtrot, bravo!